Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to a Morris Federation online event. Uh, my name is Pauline Woods Wilson, and we also have uh, Jenny and Mike Everett helping host today's event. Um, today we have Chloe Middleton Metcalf, who will be considering Morris dance as English national dress. Over to you, Chloe. Thank you, Pauline. So, um, why does England not have a national dress? It's a recurring popular quandary. In this talk, I hope to expound upon the idea of Morris dance costumes as being, or being representative of, English national dress. Now, I don't think this is a particularly far-fetched idea. Certainly other people have been happy to express this view publicly. So here we have a 2016 Guardian um, letters section. And Amanda Tempest Radford from Norwich says, as England has nothing in the way of national dress, I suggest all visiting delegates to these aisles could be issued with Morris dancing attire. Health and safety might insist the polls were modified so that the eyes could not be poked out in the course of the debate. And um, those of you that are familiar with the Project Britain website, again, we've got... Um, Two members of Moulton Morris down there on the right hand side and the suggestion that a far better choice for an English national dress would be to choose from our many customs and traditions, including Morris dancing attire. Described by British folklorist Dee Wowd in the English year as the arch symbol of official fake law, the concept of national dress, like most aspects of prescribed dressing, can be divisive. Sir David Starkey in England, My England, reassures the reader that H.G. Wells, quote, once said that it is the glory of England to have no national dress. He then alluded to a probably apocryphal attempt at national costume with a Van Dyke collar. Imagine the horror of it. He concluded. I'm pretty sure this is completely apocryphal. It is sometimes said that England does not have a national costume because it industrialised early. Therefore, there was no distinct rural clothing practices left which would be suitable. But this is simply not the case. In the Edwardian period, when a number of national costumes were being created, there were rural clothing practices which could easily have become national dress. And in addition, we do have a wealth of historical fashion trends which could have been adopted as appropriate. And what further argument do you need to um, burst the balloon of this one, that uh, Wales has a national costume, and Wales industrialised at a very similar time to England. So the absence of a national costume is simply down to popular or political will. And compared to its Celtic neighbours, England's form of nationalism was less cultural and more institutional. The symbol for this is the Union Jack. The St George's Cross is hidden and amalgamated within the wider project of Britain, just as a distinctly English identity was hidden within the right wider rubric of Britain. And Britain's nationalism is still portrayed in institutions rather than in a cel celebration of vernacular traditions and customs. Institutions such as the South Bank Centre, the Tate Modern, which um, Trish Winter and Simon Keegan Phipps memorably described as, quote, context celebrating institutionally sanctioned, sanctioned imaginations of national identity. Catchy. In contrast, Wales, who in the 1800s was seeking to create a cultural identity distinct from Britishness, embraced the idea of a Welsh national costume for particular use by folk dance groups and the competitive arena offered by I. Steadfords. The costume also offered the emerging tourist market a number of financial opportunities for expansion. Welsh national costume is still used for displays of Welsh folk dance. And I think it is appreciated for both its anachronistic as well as nationalistic associations. And of course, if you feel so inclined, versions of Welsh national dress can be purchased as a fancy dress item on eBay for under £20. 
But to take another example, to really drive the point home, the Swedish national dress, for example, was designed in 1903 by Marta Jorgensen. Part of the Swedish nationalist movement, she wanted something appropriate for her and her servants to wear. The costume took elements of rural peasant clothing, but the colours chosen were bright, the colours of the Swedish flag, of course. And the costume was officially adopted in 1983 and is worn by members of the royal family on state occasions. So there's not been that much written about uh, the concept of national dress, but we do have um, fashion historian Lou Taylor, who is rather marvellous. And she states that national costume stems from an urban, knowing, intellectual awareness of the concept of nationhood. Its sources are urban, politicised, elitist and educated. Lou Taylor then created three categories for national costume, which you can agree with or disagree with at your leisure. National struggle, which is, she defines as politically driven, such as those seen in Central and Eastern Europe. Cultural revival, such as those seen in Scotland and Nazi Germany. And commodified, such as those created for tourism or export. And of course, there are overlaps with those categories. The idea of national costume is often linked, therefore, to traditional folk or regional costumes. And often a costume's nationalness is justified by using the concept of tradition. Back to Taylor, she says, peasant styles as romanticized and utopian icons. Styles are based on ethnically based elements, which are always modified, if not indeed artificially invented. So I hope to have explained the constructed nature of national costume. And whilst every country has its own unique history of adopting specific clothing types as emblematic of nationhood, it is not the clothes which hold the power to bestow the concept of national dress, but the people who choose to wear them. Now the Edwardian period was a particularly fertile time for the popularization of national costumes, especially in Europe. And as many of you will be deeply familiar, it was also the time of the first folk revival, which saw Cecil Sharp, amongst others, promoting the older dances and musics of the village inhabitants as a vital English art, which should be brought back to the people of the towns to re-enliven their souls, and at the same time, of course, provide fodder for classical composers and the rebirth of a distinctly English classical music composition. Since that period in time, no other dance has been seen as so symbolic of a broader Englishness as Morris dancing. I, at this point, defer to Vivian Stanchel, of course, of the Bonzo Dog Doodle Band. I have a footage of the Bows of London City Morris dances at Paddington in 1960. Well, it was released in 1975, so 1974, 1975. Vivian Stanchel's sardonic voice quips I suppose this is our national costume. It's jolly anyway. Jollity should be encouraged or perhaps given a grant. Well, to take a more recent example, some of you might have seen the 2018 short film Quarantine. This, um, to, to reiterate what's on the screen, this post-Brexit pagan dance fantasy revolves around a group of English badgers who stalwartly maintain their high walls whilst practising their Morris dancing traditions. The animators make a direct link between Englishness and Morris dancing, as well as linking Morris dancing to Brexit voting conservatism. So returning to the stump of the 20th century, the first folk revival was a time when Morris dance costume was explicitly caught in the middle of a debate about how to represent Englishness. And the debate focuses around two key protagonists, who I'm sure many of you are aware of, Cecil Sharp and Mary Neal. Initially, collaborators Sharp and Neal shared sources and demonstrators. However, things eventually turned sour as the two tussled for control over the folk dance revival. This was particularly apparent in their disagreement about how to present the dances and what to dress the performers in. At the outbreak of World War I, Neil seized her folk dance activities and the centre of power fully shifted to Sharp <laughs> and the organisation which he had formed, the English Folk Dance Society. After 1932, of course, the English Folk Dance and Song Society. 
1905, Mary Neal paid a visit to Cecil Sharp to gather some English songs and other musical material to use in a philanthropic organisation that she ran in London, mostly for young working class seamstresses called the Esperance Club. Overjoyed at the keen response, quote, they were perfectly intoxicated by the music. Neil then proceeded to look for traditional dances which the club could learn. And Cecil Sharp facilitated a meeting between Neil and William Kimber, who was a traditional dancer from a Morris Green in Headington Quarry in Oxfordshire. By 1910, the Esperance Club had visited, demonstrated or taught dances in every county in England bar two inspiring the formation of new groups who often copied their style. Hence the early pictures of Thaxted in their very near-less costumes, if you've ever had the joy of seeing those images. Of the presentation of dances, Neil wrote, the idea is a village festival on a village green at holiday time. Of course, no two people will be dressed alike. For the women, she advocated a costume which referenced early 19th century rural working class dress, a tailored bodice, full skirt, apron and sunbonnet. And Neil is open about her creation of this costume. As there is no traditional dress for women Morris dancers, I will describe that which has been made popular by the Esperance girls, she would write in 1910. The costumes of these young women particularly the use of sunbonnets, would have been widely recognised in Edwardian society as a symbol of pre-industrial rural England. Neil's choice reflects the sartorial sentimentality of her time, examples of which can be found in the depictions of country life by, for example, photographer Henry Peach Robinson or the painter Helen Allington, whose work is illustrated here or even the Kate Greenaway style smock dresses which were available to buy in liberties at the end of the 19th century. Neil's costumes for the male dancers were based upon clothing worn by traditional teams. That is, oh, teams, I'm trying to define traditional here, so <laughs> loosely, that is teams of mostly working class Morris dancers from the South Midlands. Regarding the clothes of traditional teams, she noted sadly that their costumes had fallen on somewhat evil days when compared to accounts of Morris dancers from the 17th century. Neil shows a distinct inclination towards flamboyant costuming methods, whilst keeping within the idiom of the traditional dancers with whom she knew and worked. So she writes in 1915, I think that for the present day performance, one must either adopt the least objectionable form of present day holiday dress, which is usually white flannel, add as much colour as possible in ribbons and sash and leave it at that. Her men's costumes use the Bidford team from Warwickshire as a model. Now, ironically, the authenticity of the Bidford team was later questioned when it was realised that it was mostly the creation of pageant organiser and, quote, professional old English revivalist Darcy Ferris in the 1880s. But Neil's male costumes were even more decorative than the Bidford Morris. And she writes that, but it may be taken for granted that the more colour that can be introduced into the dress, the better. As in old days, there was a rivalry amongst the women as to who could send her man out to dance the Morris decked in the brightest colours. And I'm not entirely sure where she got that idea from, um, but I can't find anything to collaborate that idea um, anywhere else. If anyone knows of the source, do let me know. <laughs> so the first iterations of Sharp's Folk Dance Society also danced out in Esperance style costumes. Douglas Kennedy, who would take over the running of the EFDS upon Sharp's death in 1924, recalled. Now this is a lengthy quote, so I'm just going to take us with it too. My smock was much too long for me my hat too large and floppy. And it was with considerable trepidation that I was led out by my partner for Newcastle. I forget now who she was, but once the dance had started, I never saw her or indeed anyone until I had been safely shepherded off the floor at the end of it. At the first step, 
My foot caught in the smock and I stumbled forward, my hat falling incontinently over my eyes. I tried to restore the hat to its proper position and stumbled again and found that my intimacy with Newcastle had cooled off remarkably and that I had but the vaguest memory of its features. Suddenly, my partner seized my arm and swung me round with such vigour that the wretched hat wedged itself firmly down on my nose and I was lost indeed. I was led off and congratulated but could only find words to curse my hat. Now, while such a quote could hide as masquerading modesty, it perhaps also highlights the relief some dancers found at the eventual abandonment of the elaborate Nealesque attire. In 1907, Punch published a cartoon which depicted the Esperance Club in full attire under the caption, Merry England Once More. And it is widely considered that this cartoon acted as a catalyst in the souring of Sharp and Neil's relationship. Underscoring Neil's successful but somewhat romantic approach to dance and costume. There was increasing competition for who would head the folk dance movement, which was an acrimonious dispute which was later simplified and symbolised to be between Sharp's technique and Neil's spirit. And the final nail in the coffin of Neil's ambition, the final nail in the coffin of Neil's ambition was Sharp's formation of the English Folk Dance Society in 1911. Sharp's new costume choice deliberately moved away from pre existing stereotypes of rural dress towards a modern aesthetic. He deliberately aimed to make the dance contemporary and free from anachronism. The male costumes of the English Folk Dance Society display team appear to have been based on the simplest of traditional Morris team costumes, that of Headington Quarry, but without the headwear which would have been cricket caps. Theatrical designer Norman Wilkinson was asked by Sharp to create male and female costumes for a 1912 production of folk dances at the Savoy Theatre. However, the men's white shirts and trousers he accepted as the right basis, needing only some extra colour. At this time, the male members of the EFDS demonstration team all had individual baldricks. There wasn't um, a team baldric, as far as I am aware. So the costume of Sharp's male team consisted of white shirt, white flannel trousers, the individual baldricks, and bell pads, which were decorated with ribbons and strapped to the shins. Sharp's men did not wear hats of any sort and wore flannels, which were, of course, contemporary sporting attire. In general, Sharp's stripped back approach, I think, contrasts with the attitude of the traditional Morris dancers, which formed the basis of the inspiration for the revival. For example, Joseph Druce, who lived from 1830 to 1917, recounted that the trousers worn by his traditional team were as white as curd, made of jane, fluffy, as white as doe skin trousers, such as navies use, but thinner, what offices wear. So we're talking about a fine white trouser here, not, um, not gym pants. In comparison, Sharp's costume choice strays away from dandyism towards organised sport, which had the advantage, of course, of being both masculine and middle class. The dress of the men, Douglas and Helen Kennedy later recalled, was equally athletic being that of the cricket pitch and tennis court, the bells and cross baldricks being the only traces of traditional practice. The women's costumes designed by Norman Wilkinson were originally of a light blue material, which was made up into a high-waisted, long-skirted dress with the waistband carrying cherry-coloured ribbons and rosettes. And that was the previous image. This is a later adaptation. However, the main proportion of Sharp's female adherents did not wear the blue dresses designed for the hand-picked demonstration team, of course. For the majority, gym pinnacles were seen as appropriate for public displays as well as for practice. The masculinized and modernist presentation of Sharp's dancers arguably created a representation of English folk which was more palatable to the intellectual elite particularly the Board of Education, of which Sharp was made inspector in 1909. The move away from Merry England towards a subtler form of nationalism 
I think epitomizes England's wider approach to overt patriotism. So returning to this concept of England and Britain again, the concept of Britishness nurtured since the early 18th century to stabilize the union with Scotland, continued to be influential and consciously sublimating a distinct English identity within a wider British one. Sharp's folk costume suited the generally subtle nature of English patriotism, where the myths of the nation were not founded on folklore but on institutions. The locus for national pride and identity lay in the concept of parliament, democracy, Britain and empire. And Sharp's use of sports attire aligned more easily with other symbolic identifications of middle class Englishness, particularly the public school, the cricket pitch and the concept of the gentleman. Now, it might have struck some of you that so far we've been talking about women's and men's Morris costumes, but there was a time in the revival when Morris dancing was dominated by men, symbolically at least. In the 1920s, there was a concerted effort to defeminize Morris dancing and to actively discourage teachers, teachers who had signed up to the English Folk Dance Society to get their folk dancing certificates and to have the form as the sole preserve of men. So this is an interesting tangent to the main gist of my lecture, for if Morris dancing is a male activity, what should female folk dancers wear when they demonstrated country dancing? The EFDS costume Sharper designed were reconfigured with minor changes throughout the 1920s. Then, in 1929, it was considered that a change was in order, and a competition was run to design a new outfit, and I can reveal the winners of that competition. So the EFDS news at the time, 1929, September, says, it is generally admitted that the dresses worn by the dancers at the folk dance demonstrations are not equal to the standard of dancing. Derogatory remarks have often been overheard at the Albert Hall Festival and also at branch festivals, but such remarks apply only to the women's dresses. As the men are fortunate, in having a traditional costume. For the women dancers, there is no traditional dress and dresses have therefore to be created. And that is where the trouble begins. So there were two winners to the 1929 costume competition, but the final designs were not widely adopted. And over the next 40 years, the subject of what women should wear re-emerged many times. In 1938, the EFDS commissioned a design from the Ravel School of Fashion, and members could order fabric and pattern kits from the society. But even this design did not last for long, as Kennedy had another change of heart. And by 1946, he of the floppy hat fame was keen to rebrand the society. We do not want any more uniforms. We want colour, especially for the Morris, and Morris and Sword have their appropriate regalia. The social dancers want to be gay, but if used for recruiting, the exponents do not want to be too different from the rest of the world. It's a nuisance that the need to combine the team display with the social dance usually means that the men look over garnished beside the bystander in his dark blue suit. If there are enough men, then some should act as decoys and be in their suits. But the girls should look like girls and not a bit like each other. And that is what is wrong with the festival dress designed for the society before the war by Ravel and Co. It is too synthetic and too much of a uniform. It was a brave experiment, but there is no future that way. I have abandoned it. I have abandoned it at Stratford. And I won't recommend any more being made. Girls are too individual for so set a pattern. And it is as individuals that they will do their best recruiting. So Douglas Kennedy there evidently saying that the female costumes are key to the future of social folk dance. So three years later, he's still on, um, still on the same trajectory and that uh, he edited a page of suitable ideas for, for women or for um, English folk dancers. And um, I do like Douglas Kennedy's quotes. He's just um, so flamboyant with his words. So I'll just indulge in one more lengthy Douglas Kennedy quote, if you will excuse me. 
With foreign dancers visiting us and foreign dancing journeys for ourselves in view, we shall assuredly feel the urge for something specifically English. Nothing is easier. If we seek a period look to match our partners, there are lovely embroidered collarettes and capelets in every family. There are English laces coming back into fashion. Buckinghamshire, Nottinghamshire, Honiton and others for chemise sets and softening edges. English cottons are famed all over the world and English light materials lead the markets. Ideas from readers can also have a place and rough sketches would be redrawn if necessary. It is recommended, however, that these remain English and that fancy dress be eschewed. Well, Douglas Kennedy's attempts at individualism did not last for long. As if by stealth, a new festival dress costume was developed without much fanfare in the pages of English Dance and Song, the Society's magazine. It was established enough by 1964 for the Society to seek opinions on it. The festival dress, as it came to be known, consisted for women of white blouse, black waistcoat and a brightly coloured circle skirt, often with a supporting petticoat. It was in a number of ways very similar to that proposed in 1938 by Ravel. And I've got for you two videos of, uh, of this particular costume in action. And if you'll bear with me, because um, I prepared my link so long ago, it's now timed out. Can you see the video? Can you just put your thumbs up if you can see the... Okay. Can you see it now? We want to know a little more about it. Will you show us how the steps are done? Was 1950s, that particular one. There you go. So the costume, this festival dress, was not universally popular. In 1963, Bill Smith, a um, member of the EFDSS, would complain of the festival dress as that grim leveller which lends an aura of drab conformity on the distaff side and a touch of gore blimey on the spear side. One visualises a corpse of undertakers in dark pants and ties, dancing attendance on their regimentally petticoated ladies. And in 1964, Rosemary Radmore opinioned, personally, when wearing the present rig out, I feel like the poor relation of a chorus girl in some Ruritarian type operetta. An annual prestigious festival held by the society at the Royal Albert Hall, in which members of the branches were invited to perform mass dances, which was the first video I showed, helped to standardize this costume among EFDS clubs in the 1960s and into the 1970s. And in the 2000s, 
I'm sure many of you are aware that a version of it was still worn by some folk dance clubs. Members of the English Folk Dance and Song Society still debated whether a historical costume would be more appropriate. But while some individual teams went their own way, or clubs I should say, no one interpretation took off. In the 1950s, to come back to the men, it became common for men to wear waistcoats for displays of social dance. And at this point, waistcoats became an optional extra for men's Morris kits also. And if the team did not have a set image they wanted on the waistcoat, then it was a chance to get creative with what was considered to be appropriate imagery. And here are two examples that I'm lucky enough to have in the folk costume archives, which both date from the 1950s. After Sharp's death in 1924, black breeches had become, com but had become more common rather than white flannel or sports trousers for male dancers. And this was in part precipitated by the performances of different types of dance, which did not give enough time for costume change. So if you're doing a show with sword, Morris and social dance, it was considered that breeches were best, the best option for all three. In 1930, as early as that, the EFDS adopted black sword dance breeches for performances of Morris dances by the male members of their demonstration team. And this change was, quote, prompted by the very urgent problem of laundry presented by the use of white flannels. It was found that the audiences preferred knee breeches and they were, quote, particularly suited to a stage presentation of the dances. The costumes were considered to be as suited to the Morris and country dance as it is to the rapper dance. And in the same paper, the society announced that at all formal demonstrations, the EFDS team would now be in knee breeches rather than white flannels. So when I analyse the costume choice amongst 19th century traditional Cotswold teams, those teams whose dances form the inspiration for Sharp's revival, the majority of references to specific colours gave red, white and blue as the most common for decoration. But this is a little odd. So an 1886 article which discussed Morris dance in the 1830s and 1840s by its, its Rao 1886 stated that the colours were various, but generally those of the noblemen or leading family in the parish. So this might explain why Kirtlington in Oxfordshire in the 1840s, the dancers performed in pale pink and light blue, which were the colours of the Dashwood family. And pale pink and light blue were the same colours which were worn by all official attendants at the Kirtlington Lamb Hale. So it is possible that as the majority of references to the other traditional teams date from after the big jubilee celebration of 1887, the red, white and blue were picked specifically for their patriotic connotations. And a similar occurrence happened for Queen Elizabeth's silver jubilee in 1977. A number of teams were formed around this time to dance at local celebrations and many wore red, white and blue. So here is the decorative paraphernalia used by Christian Jubilee Morris, who were formed at that time but folded in 2016. Red and white remains a popular colour choice for Morris teams, especially those dancing Cotswold Morris. And personally, I've danced with two recently formed teams, Nonsuch and Bells of London City, both formed in the last 20 years, who both wear these colours. The 1970s also saw the recreation of women's Morris teams. Many of these teams chose historically themed dresses, which tied in with the Laura Ashley fashionable aesthetic of the time. Not many of these teams have retained their original costume choice, and by the 2000s, many flaunted a modern paired back costume with the colour black taking a more predominant role. The biggest growth area of Morris dancing in recent years has been in the border style, and no whiff of white and red costumes here. Many teams wear rag jackets and black trousers. Preparing for this talk made me think about the connection between this style of Morris and alternative expressions of Englishness. Does national costume need to be associated with the international folk festival arena? Or are connections drawn between border costumes and other stories about English pasts and presents? Do or will people associate these costumes with ideas about Englishness? Certainly Catelyn Moran did. Um, and I should have I should have inserted that quote there, but I've only just made the connection. Um, Catelyn Moran saw the Witchmen at uh, the Witty Sea Straw Bear Festival and uh, was transported back into ancient England of peasants with no thermal underwear. 
It's a witty quote. I can dig it out for anyone that's interested. Now, the same question can be asked of Boss Morris, whose otherworldly presentation of the Cotswold style often sees him garbed in innovative, various and surreal costumes. Are they considered to be projecting or embodying certain interpretations of Englishness? Perhaps not the fate on the village green, but perhaps the village green at night under a hunter's moon. Conversation starter. The high point for the creation of English national dress has, in my opinion, passed. As one who spent much time as a teenager sketching what a female English national costume would look like, and an even longer time elaborately embroidering my, me and my husband's Morris shirts, this has not been an easy blow to take. But national costume needs an arena. Specifically, I think it needs international comparison. And the heyday of the big international folk dance gatherings are gone. And other arenas where national or regional dress can be seen do not apply in England. The Anglican Church has a different Sunday dress code to the Romanian Orthodox Church. The biggest opportunity for those who wish to reignite the idea, and there are occasional websites which pop up selling sunbonnets or promoting the idea of Anglo-Saxon apparel, would be the fracture of the United Kingdom. Now this might prompt the re-evaluation of Englishness and give potential popular political will for the formalisation of some costume to represent the nation. However, maybe the long link with Morris and folk dance costume might hinder even this uncomfortable scenario. After all, it seems to me that many people are relieved that Morris dance costumes can be half-heartedly brought out as a mocking option for English national dress, as it seems to make a fool of the whole idea, and poke holes in the uncomfortable projection of an exclusive English nationalism, which I, amongst many, wish to avoid. Thank you. Are you ready for questions then, Chloe? I'll oh, just have a glug. Yes, have a glug. I've had a, um, a note in the chat from Mike Heaney. Mike, do you want to share your comment with Chloe rather than me? Yeah, OK, it's just because I was sort of not looking where the, quote was, where the <laughs> chat was going. That's right. Um, that, you mentioned, Chloe, about uh, um, the idea of um, you know the men being um, costumed splendidly by their girlfriends I think it was oh yeah uh, and uh, I, it just reminded me of the, the Max Beerbohm article from Harper's Magazine 1907 which is just the right time to have picked it up um, he wrote an article in Harper's Magazine called a Morris for May Day and that was in fact based on his encounter with the Ensham men a couple of years previously and he writes I was told that the wife or sweetheart of every dancer takes special pains to deck her man out more gaily than his fellows. But so bewildering was the amount of brand new bunting attached to all these eight men that no matron or maiden could for the life of her determine which was the most splendid of them all. Oh, that brilliant. Thank you, Mike. I evidently should have um, emailed you in advance. <laughs> uh, that's, that's really brilliant. It, it just always struck me as perplexing because um, a, a lot of the teams did aim for uniformity of appearance. Yeah, and um, yeah, there's a, Mary Neal definitely would not have known as this one, but it's not just Max Beerbohm's isolated reference. Um, there was um, a short story in Charles Dickens's magazine published in 1851, which was in fact written by somebody who had seen Morris dancers in the Forest of Dean. And he writes, you know, happy the maid who has decked her lover out with finery. She loves to see her ribbons glorified. So. So do you think there was a mix of, of teams where there would have been more individuality in the costumes um, um, and then the teams where there would have been definite uniformity? I mean, you look at Headington Quarry, they weren't all wearing different headgear and outcompete. They were all wearing the same cricket caps. And I hesitate to pontificate. OK, OK. Oh, interesting. Maybe it's something that changed over time. Uh, Chloe, do you want to stop screen sharing unless we need it? And uh, can anybody else, would anybody else like to ask a question? You can put your hands up or there's not too many of us. You could just unmute and ask a question.
Judith, is that you, Judith Proctor, with a question? Yeah, yeah. not so much a question as a, as a just a random data point. I remember when I was about 10 years old, I belonged to a, a small local country dance crew, and we wore skirts that were very much like the one Chloe described, basically a full circle skirt made of felt. Every dancer had a different colour. I can't remember what we wore as a top, but I do remember the skirts. So that would have been back in the sort of, about, about 65, 66, something like that. I do, I do wonder if there was ever any, um, ever any connection with the square dance boom. Not in our case, because it was very definitely country dancing rather than square dancing. But yes, it, I can see the potential connection. Yeah, the, the 1950s came along and then suddenly it's all full circle skirts. And... Yes. Thank you, Judy. Got Jenny and Mike. Yeah, it's just, it's just, um, just hearing Jude just saying about, she didn't remember what she wore on her top. I can remember doing folk dancing and it was a circle skirt and it was, the top was a T shape. And I wonder looking back now, uh, because all the mums had to make the costumes, whether actually a circle is a really useful shape and a T is a really useful shape. For those who, who aren't really very well blessed with needlework skills. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? Uh, John McMahon. Thank you. And really amazing, really fascinating uh, lecture, Chloe. Thank you. And particularly interesting sort of the, the sort of intertwining with contemporary questions of national identity. I have a, a question around um, just curious as to whether you perceive any sort of interrelationship or, or feedback loop between um, the garb of sort of uh, calendar customs in the ritual year and Morris costuming, uh, whether that's ever sort of looped in and out at any point of um, sort of progress that you've outlined. Well, well, the, the joy of calendar customs is they're so diverse, aren't they? And then um, just in in the costuming practices that, that that you can find there and um i think the other joy about them is they a lot of them have really strong roots with their local communities um and morris dancing is a little bit different in that it has got this more broader national network I and mean, i'm talking to you from the morris federation's talk um so i think there are differences there um you don't get um the castleton Garland King and Queen appearing at, at folk festivals. So there are particular worlds that the Morris dancing operates in, which is quite distinct from calendar customs. But then, of course, you get appearances of Morris dancers at, at many events. Um, but I think with calendar customs, you've really got to take them on an individual on an individual basis there. Definitely, but I, I mean, I was just thinking about whether there's been that sort of feedback loop in terms of the aesthetic um, at all. And as you, I mean, I, I live in. Uh, Hebden Bridge so we, we've got uh, you know Sorby Bridge Rush Bearing is one of the big local ones obviously loads of different sides from all over the country converge on that but there's a you know um, a, a specific form of dress to those involved in the Rush Bearing also which okay. seems to be inspired by aspects of that that sort of um, okay. development of Morris costume but I think it feeds yeah, back I in a way as well. I do think that the border Morris rag jacket in particular, you see similar things at Hastings, Jack and the Green. And, Haxi um, as well. And where, sorry? Haxi Hood, maybe. Yeah. Well, in, in my head, I sort of link it to, to ones where the costume choices happened in the last 40 years. Um, you seem to get more of interpretations of this modern border shirt. Um, but the board shirt looks fabulous and is quite easy to make, so you can understand why it would be picked up. And it's not particularly unusual as an idea. You've only got to look at um, pictures from, from our neighbours <laughs> over the um, uh, over the ocean to see that like European countries having this ragged jacket is not particularly unusual. So I, I hesitate to say entirely that people have been inspired by the border tradition. However, um, you could also make that case, I think. 
um, in some instances. But you have to make it quite carefully, I think. You have to line up all your dates. Well, thank you. And thanks again for the amazing lecture as well. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, next up is Graham Baldwin. Well, hello, and thank you, Chloe, for a, a very interesting presentation. Uh, one thing that comes to mind from watching it was that uh, you start off talking, uh, showing lots of uh, other national dresses, and there's a, there's a level of uniformity and acceptance by those nations of the national dress. I see anything but in the Morris world acceptance of uniformity, except possibly within certain teams. The nearest we seem to have got to it is uh, in, the, um, in the Olympics, when there was a couple of sides turned up and performed there. So what my question really is, do you see any, any direction where we're aiming towards a uniform national dress, uh, uniform Morris national dress, for women or for men? I don't, personally, and I don't see it going anywhere in that direction right now, but over to you. Okay, so um, you make a few interesting points there. Like the Swedish example is particularly regimented, and I guess my Welsh picture was of a, a Welsh dance team, and um, so they've got uniformity within that team. Um, but what is interesting when you dig in the dig around this concept of national dress it is so um, so fluid. So you look at if you pick Scotland as an example, you, you might think that you know what Scottish national dress is, and it's a tartan, but it's not all the same tartan. Um, and people have different ideas of, they've got an, a vague idea of what Scottish national dress is, but um, does it involve the spore and does it not involve the spore and does it involve this, does it involve that? You know, there's quite a lot of um, flexibility in the various aspects of it. Um, so I don't think national dress has to be a particularly prescribed, um, prescribed form, but then you've got other countries where they do have um, official prescription um, in their national dress, but there's not, there's not that many of them. So national dress on the whole remains this quite fluid concept. And it's what's really interesting to me is, is where dance comes in and this relationship between English national, sorry, between representing the nation and folk dance. And then what do you put the dances in? And it's at that point you get this interaction of, well, these dancers sort of representing their country and what are they wearing? And do those clothes represent the nation too? And it's that sort of um, interchange. So I don't think it has to be all uniform. And I don't think there's ever going to be any, I can't see any push for a uniform Morris costume to represent England. Unless I suppose we have another big event like um, like the um, Olympics. But of course the Olympics, that was, that was Rag Morris, wasn't it? And uh, Black Heath. So two London teams, and Blackheath's costume was as it is. And Rag Morris from Bristol, they picked one dance and they said, we all want you to look like him. Um, go and make your costumes like that particular individual. So, um, yeah, I do have in the archive, actually, an Olympic uh, Rag Morris costume, which is great, because the guys said I had to make a duplicate costume, they're never going to wear it again, and the shoes were terrible. Um, but, yes, I've gone off on a tangent there, sorry. Thank you for that question. And next up is Sarah Scarlett. Hello. Um, I'm a um, professional in the uh, garment trade. I, I teach at a university making clothes. So um, I wonder if there's an alignment with the um, rise of border costumes with actually the uh, lowering of skill level of sewing in the, in the populace. Because in the early part of the last century everyone knew how to sew and and if you handed out some fabric and a pattern people would be able to make it themselves but i don't think that would be the case at this point um and that might be why the mo much more easy to construct costume of the border rag shirt is way more popular Yes, I, I completely agree with you. So you can see the simplification of costumes, not only in Border, but in um, Cotswold Morris. And we have a form called Northwest that I haven't really talked about. Um, and in the 1970s, there was a lot more getting a pattern. The women would make, make the pattern up. Um, but now there's a lot more black t-shirts, black trousers, black skirts, things you can buy off the peg and then modify. And then you're only having to make sashes or additional sort of paraphernalia. Um, and I think it's not only competency, it's also willingness to de designate time 
mm. um, in teams, there is that aspect. There's aspect going on. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> really good talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And um, I hope that I didn't assume too much Morris information. <laughs> I hope that there was a balance there for you. <laughs> I also dance with a um, side that wears a rag waistcoat. Um, uh, you might recognize the rainbow. Oh, loose women. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we are prone to the same thing, but um, with color, like you were saying from the beginning, which um, really delighted me that there was recording at the beginning that there was an attempt to put as many colors on as possible. And we certainly do that. <laughs> yeah, that was certainly Neil's Neil's view. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And we've got now got a question from Peter. Hi, uh, Chloe. Sorry, I couldn't unmute there. Uh, great lecture. Thanks. Just a couple of points. Um, one was that there are a number of references. I know that plays are very different from dances, but in, in the folk, uh, in folk performances of uh, people adorning costumes in ways that had nothing to do with uh, stage representation and, and sometimes seeming to run, run away with themselves a bit, you know, a lot of uh, women wanting to sew a lot of ribbons onto their partner's costumes, regardless of what part they were actually playing, you know, so uh, um, that I'll try and find some references which I could send to you there, uh, some from Cornwall certainly. And the other thing was the uh, dreadful creep of, uh, of contemporary things in, into dance costumes. Um, when I danced in the, in the 60s, that 1950s Faith Kemp design that you showed uh, had, had caught us bang to rights at the time. But the other thing was, we were strongly recommended uh, uh, to wear bry nylon shirts and string vests, uh, not, neither of which you much want to associate with the folk tradition, but this was for, in, in Monks Eaton Morris men were doing stage shows that involved lots of different dancers and lots of costume changes. And the string vests were meant to keep us warm when we were outside and the shirts were meant to be easier to wash and dry. They were, of course, hideous to wear, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad they've disappeared from the world, as far as I know. Uh, but it would be interesting to think about how materials and changes in materials actually impact on the kind of ideas that people have in the same way that um, the decline of sewing in the general population probably has a bearing. So just an observation, but I didn't know how interested I was in this question until I heard you this afternoon. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's funny because I have the English Folk Costume Archive. I, I have wonderful donations. And um, recently this year I got Ron Smedley's um, Morris kit for part of it. And um, it was almost like breaches through the ages. So uh, he started off in the 1950s. There were some beautiful tailor-made wool trousers, wool breeches. Um, and then he, he stopped in the 1980s and then you've got sort of not even M&S but nylon, 100% nylon cut down trousers which were altered. Um, so yeah, you're presented with a very real um, evolution of kit. So it's still the same idea, it's still black breeches but it's a very different feel and um, outlay of resources as well. I imagine one would have cost a lot more than the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks, Peter. And uh, back to Judith. I think the point that was made earlier about the lack of sewing skills is presumably mostly due to the sheer availability of cheap ready-made clothing. I recall one team starting up north not long ago that they simply decided the entire team were going to go and buy the same outfit from Marks and Spencers and uh, have an instant kit ready that way. Yes, I mean, I've been in teams that have, have done that. I remember Stony Steppers when we changed kits. It was what you can buy at the time. 
Uh, and then, of course, five years later, it's all faded or, or something's happened or you've got five new members of five different sizes. And how much do you bulk buy in advance and all those different questions? Oh, yeah. but, uh, I remember when I was but, but we, we do have a throwaway culture, so you could just throw it all out and start again. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we were sort of halfway along the line when I was at university because I remember adapting a pair of trousers to turn into breeches for my boyfriend who was in the Morris team at that point. Mm. Just, I mean, they were, but didn't make brilliant breeches, but you know, it was just taking a pair of trousers, cutting them down, putting a band around the bottom, and just sort of shaping them into breeches, basically. Yeah, Bob's your uncle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I suppose some kits end up being half and half. For instance, Southern Style wear black with waistcoats, and some of the waistcoats are bought, and some of them are handmade, depending on which team member it is. Okay. Yeah. I think we've got maybe time for a couple more. Couple more, yeah. Thank yeah. you, Judith. So next is Derek Schofield. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks you. very much, Chloe. Um, I think in the 1920s and 30s, one of the factors that um, affected um, the discussion about uh, folk costumes within the EFDS, EFDSS, um, was the interaction with international dance teams and going abroad. Uh, and then in particular, the 1935 festival, something that I'm just looking at at the moment for next week's conference. Um, but um, I thought you might like this little quote, which was a, a, uh, one of the press reports from the 1935 big international folk dance festival, which the EFDSS hosted at, in London. Um, 17 different countries represented. Anyway, this was one of the press reports. Uh, folk dancing has, for most people, a decidedly bogus flavour. It suggests earnest women in greenery, yallery smocks and pallid, flannel-trousered men dragooning self-conscious yokels into dancing synthetic cantrips. I have shed some of my prejudices. <laughs> And that was as a, as a result of seeing not that sort of costume, but the sort of more elaborate costume from the uh, countries, Bulgaria and Hungary and, uh, and Western European countries. Oh, that's but, that, maybe you sorry. could email that to me, Derek, that'd be lovely. <laughs> but certainly, yeah, we'll do. Um, but certainly there was concern, um, I've just been trying to look for the quote, but I can't find it, about the sort of fairly drab costumes of flannels and uh, and so on that, sure. uh, the, that the English folk dancers were wearing compared with the, the, the more elaborate sort of um, costumes of the European counterparts. That's it. Yeah, brilliant. I'd love to have that email. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Um, we've got two more waiting. So that's uh, Pete Beeren next, please. Hello. Can you Hello. hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, it's still going back to the 20s and 30s that Derek was just talking about, but from a Northwest Morris aspect, um, I did some research a while back with uh, some ladies uh, who danced at that time with a Miss Stitchfield's team in Bolton. And they were all wearing what um, sort of pretty frocks, little white frocks, white pumps, um, crepe ro rosettes on, on, on the costumes. And, and they've been wearing, Miss Stitchfield's team, as far as I can gather, have been wearing that from the early 1900s through to the late 1920s. But then along come uh, the Adelaide Street um, Morris dancers, who are the same sort of area. Uh, and and they, they've got a jazz band, as in kazoo band, and dressed in very militaristic costumes, uh, and, and the, uh, the dancers were wearing something very similar. Uh, and they were saying they couldn't compete, really, so these, these old-fashioned dresses of uh, white and, and crepe rosettes against this militaristic thing, which, of course, is the start of the, the whole carnival thing. But... Um, it's a bit of a an aside, really, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> I love um, I love looking at the photos of, of Northwest teams, girls teams in the 1900s and, and the 
10s and 20s and the sheer diversity of, of costumes which are, are displayed there is really quite something to behold um but yeah no that's very interesting that the overlap with oh i want to say carnival morris but we yeah and um the, the idea of competition and present how important presentation was as well yeah I'm, I'm sorry, I did rather neglect the Northwest. I am, it, I do apologize. That was a big omission. Um, I guess I wanted to focus more on this, the, the general representations of Englishness, which do tend to be more sort of Cotswold focused. Um, so apologies. Well, that can be your next talk, Chloe. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh. Anyway, uh, back to Graham for the, I think, the last question. Okay, back to me again. I've got my video going this time, even though I'm still in my pyjamas, because it's, uh, well, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning where I am, you see. <laughs> <laughs> um, over to, it seems to me that this is going to be a continuously moving issue of, of, of costume for the Morris. Uh, now, in the last 10 or 20 years, I would, and I, I would say, in, certainly in the UK, uh, uh, there's... Uh, the preponderance of border Morris has pretty well taken over. There's probably more border Morris sides now than any other sort of Morris in uh, worldwide, I suspect. Um, and the dress that they adopt seems to have been very much modelled on one side, and that is Shropshire Bedlands. Now, there's, again, traditionally, there's, there's only a few border sides. You know, there's Much Wenlock, Elton, uh, Bromsbury Heath, Dillwyn that had rags and ribbons and things. And it's, so it seems that modern, modern sides, they don't give a toss about history. They don't give a toss about where, what it was like in the past. They do what they enjoy doing now. And they're gonna, the, the costume will evolve accordingly. Right now, the rag coat of uh, Shropshire Bedlams is the, uh, is the style du jour. What will it be in the future? Chloe, over to you. Very eloquently put there. Um... I don't know if you saw the Morris Federation's free download on the evolution of dark Morris, but um, it's an article I wrote recently that you can download off the Morris Fed, and it does look at the proportion of border teams and the evolution of the costumes and all of that. And I don't think it's entirely fair to say that people that do border Morris don't care about tradition. There's an idea of, um, you know, I'm a bit of an academic, a bit of a historian, um, not everyone wants to go down that route and look at everything in detail, but that doesn't mean that they don't care. Um, and you've got to care a bit about the past in order to want to do Morris dancing anyway, surely. That's got to be one of the attractions. Otherwise, you just do Chiroc, insert dance here. There's got to be something about the dance form and its imagined or real roots to the past that attracts, surely. I think that's a whole other talk. I'll probably I'll take issue with you there, Chloe, because it seems to me that most of the border Morris sides I see these days are more interested in paganism than anything to do with. That. In other words, it's more. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I interviewed sixty. I interviewed sixty Morris dancers and musicians and asked them explicitly, you know, what are your religious views? And I was trying to draw out this link with paganism. Um, and I was really interested in that although there's a higher um, with the teams I interviewed, sure, it's not all teams. There was a higher than average um, self uh, a certain pagan population, um, but it wasn't nearly 50 percent. You know, it was still a very small percentage. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I've been in teams where I've had, you know, historical arguments with them about face blacking. And you just get the impression that people don't want to know the, the truth about the past. But th that is a completely different um, kettle of fish. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> uh, any more for any more? No, I think we've run out of steam now, Chloe. Oh, that's good. Uh, I'm good. I've got the jackie potatoes on. Yeah. So I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Chloe for a fascinating talk, and I should look forward to her future ones. And uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and give her a wait a couple of things and then give her a big round of applause please thank you
thank you all for coming and um, we'll see you yeah. at the next talk um is it chloe do you wish to say anything else about any future talks you've got coming up next week? oh if, if if no one's doing anything next saturday the eftis are doing their conference on diversity and there'll be loads of really good speakers there and you can attend remotely in person yeah and i can send a link out to that in the email that i send out following the event oh, very good, very good. Okay. Thank all right thank you very much everybody thank you chloe are you are you coming personally?